Thank you. First, I want to say that is the first time and is so brave of uh, someone not of Haisla ancestry saying thank you in our language. Um, so my hat's off to you for, for doing that. Um, I can speak in front of 400 people easily, uh, but when we include some of our, my, my family, my friends, my colleagues, uh, please forgive me, I feel a little bit shaky and a little bit nervous right now. Um, so good afternoon. It is an absolute honor um, to be here speaking uh, in, in such a, um, in place of such a, 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 who seemed to be a very, very strong Indigenous woman, um, Sarah. I actually had the honor of speaking uh, at the BAMP Forum, um, which was also in honor of, of Sarah. So this is the second speaking engagement um, that I've, I've been honored to do um, in, in relation to her. I've heard that she was a tremendous, tremendous woman. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, so thank you for coming to our community to learn about Haisla Nation and our experience building a healthy and prosperous community and for your commitment to advancing reconciliation in Canada. It is a great honour for me to accept the request to deliver the 2024 PPF and Action Canada annual lecture on reconciliation. I have tremendous gratitude to be here today to share with you how our pursuit of economic self-determination self is supporting a prosperous future for our people, as well as Canada and beyond. And perhaps more specifically for this audience, how what we are doing on Canada's Northwest Coast can serve as a precedent for how Canada can propel prosperity across all corners of our country. The Haisa Nation are, if anything, a resilient community. And I think the same is true for all Indigenous communities across Canada. When you reflect on our country's dark past of Indigenous relations and the ongoing attempts at reconciliation, Indigenous communities have had to be resilient. We have had to protect our culture and traditions, overcome the marginalization of our people, and raise our children without the same privileges as other Canadians. We are resilient because we are still here growing stronger in mind, body, and spirit. We have remained true to our ancestors and their way of life. We are charting a new path towards ultimate independence and self-sufficiency. And while the world around us is growing ever more volatile with the impacts of climate change, geopolitical tensions, the challenges associated with the cost of living, there is so much that can be learned from the resilience, resiliency of Canadian, Canada's Indigenous people. Learnings that I am proud to share so that we can collectively turn the page and fight for a better, more prosperous future for our country, where all citizens have the opportunities to advance their economic well-being. And one very important way to do so is to elevate the role of Indigenous communities in advancing responsible development and climate action. It is a win-win undertaking and one we must work on together. For those that don't know, the Haisla Nation are a proud community of over 2,000 people living in, on their unceded ancestral lands on the north coast of British Columbia. For thousands of years, our people have lived off the land and water, water resources in our traditional territory on Canada's rugged northwest coast. As you will see from your visit, we are rich in these resources in our territory. Protecting those resources for future generations is an integral value of Haisla people. I was born here in, in Kinemat village and raised by my family, mostly by my grandparents. While we were poor, we never felt that way as we were rich in love and care bestowed on me and my twin sister by our family and elders. We celebrated our traditions. We heard our language being spoken in our home. We ate traditional food. We felt rich because of this. But we were poor. We, ex we experienced poor health and suicides and the terrible side effects of living in poverty. There were not many opportunities for young people or young women like me in our community. We did not have big dreams for our future. I recall being 11 or 12 years old walking by our band office on the way to school thinking the only jobs that I ever really have in our community was to be a janitor or working as assistant in our old band office. We looked across the channel from our village where the aluminum smelter 
was the main employer in the area. An industry that came into our traditional territory, took what they wanted, and gave back very little, if at all, in terms of benefits. Some were lucky to get a job at the smelter, but unemployment in our village remained high. We have stood on the sidelines as industry entered our territory and transformed our land without our input or our consent. And our traditional land and settlements were impacted by industry who never cared to form a relationship with us or seek to benefit from our traditional knowledge. Our culture was not respected, our language virtually disappeared, and our people left their their home territory in pursuit of opportunities and support that we could not provide. While a lot has changed since then, I remain a fierce advocate for how much more we can, can and should have. And when I say more, I mean as owners and decision makers in our future. Because of the chiefs and the elders who came before me, leading our community towards a more prosperous future, we are experiencing an incredible reversal of fortune Instead of managing poverty, we are now managing prosperity. To get to the point we are at now, our nation and other nations have had to fight for what was long described as a share and a say for a proper seat at the table where decisions are made. Historically, our people were not afforded that opportunity. We were forced in, on the sidelines as industry entered our territory and transformed our land without consent. In more recent memory, we have developed better relationships with industry who have come to our territory. Over the last decade, the Heisler Nation has been the epicenter of the largest private sector investment in Canadian history. LNG Canada will be the country's first LNG export facility when, it's, when it starts operating in the coming months. And the Heisler Nation have been a part of the project from studying its impacts and benefits, pro providing input from our traditional and local knowledge alongside the proponent. We have been respected and valued by LNG Canada. Our people have received essential training and jobs during construction, and many of them will have secure, good paying jobs during operations. We have formed incredible joint venture partnerships with world-class companies that are providing Heisla businesses with learnings and expertise across a variety of industry and employing our people. Our experience over the past decade has yielded incredible learnings and opportunities for the Haisla and surrounding Indigenous communities. However, what we recognize during this time is that benefit agreements only get us a part of the way. Through our work with LNG Canada, the Haisla Nation have recognized the incredible opportunity to put our efforts towards projects that re will reduce the world's reliance on coal and higher emitting fuels. And for us, we learned about what it takes to be an owner and conversely, how much more we can achieve when we are in the driver's seat. Cedar LNG is a $400 billion LNG export facility with one of the lowest carbon footprints in the world. And it's the world's first indigenous majority owned LNG export facility. With Cedar LNG, we are proud to provide an indigenous led solution that will displace higher emitting energy options such as coal in Asia. Without solutions like LNG, we will not be able to drive down emissions in the near term. In China, for example, The Guardian recently reported that in the first half of 2024, 41 gigawatts of new coal-fired generation was underway. That is equivalent of almost 40 site Cs being constructed just this year. We are passionate about contributing to the global issue of climate change by helping China and other countries in Asia pivot towards LNG as a cleaner and more responsibly produced energy form of energy and see it as our responsibility to do so as responsible stewards of the environment. And as stewards of the environment, we are making sure we are producing, we are producing here at home is the best possible for the environment. As owners, we have ensured our values are guided are guiding decision making so that Cedar LNG will be the cleanest pro project possible. We selected an innovation, innovative floating design that minimized terrestrial impacts. We also researched a number of alternative cooling options and opted to go with air cooling to prevent direct contact between marine environment and refrigerant. And perhaps one of the most important decisions we made was to power the facility entirely with renewable energy. These decisions will, be, will enable us to be the owners of one of, if not the cleanest LNG facility in the world. 
many came in and said it couldn't be done this, done the way we wanted it done. That would be, we would be sacrificing financial gains. And um, as I am sure you can imagine, we have become all too used to hearing this, but we, we remain steadfast in our values that have guided us for hundreds of years. Values of sustainability, values of environmental stewardship, and values of collaboration. We also had to fight hard to get a seat at the table with government to discuss our project and how we could work together to ensure the project would be successful. And sadly, our request to be treated fairly like proponents that came before us were not initially met with enthusiasm. We were told that projects like ours would not be supported by government and that if we chose to advance an LNG project in our territory, it could only be done by meeting unfeasible conditions set by government, even though we had already made the choice to design a virtually net zero project. We have also had to endure years of opposition from outsiders who want to force us backwards by telling us what we can and cannot do in our territory. This is not what reconciliation looks like. In fact, it is the exact opposite. When we respect First Nations role as stewards of their lands and owners with the decision-making abilities of every other multinational corporation that government has supported, that is when we will start to see the real step in our step change in our economy. We persevered and we eventually got to where we wanted with government, where we were working collaboratively to advance a new kind of LNG industry for Canada. We have succeeded where other LNG proponents have failed. And while I'm not intending to highlight the failures of others, what I hope our success highlights is how much more we can achieve for the environment and our economy when we elevate the role of Indigenous communities in these developments. I am proud to share that at the start of the summer, we made a positive final investment decision on Cedar LNG. That day, our small nation made history as Cedar LNG became the first Indigenous majority-owned LNG export facility in the world. But moreover, what Cedar allows us to do for the first time ever is change the course of history on our own terms. So reconciliation is a word we hear a lot uttered by citizens, government, and industry. What re reconciliation looks like may differ across these groups. For us, it means being treated equally with the same rights and privileges as you and your neighbor. It means having control of our own revenue stream and not being subject to making decisions about what is best for our community based on available funding from government. Reconciliation is not attending a luncheon, reciting another land acknowledgement, or checking a box on an ESG checklist. It means enabling Indigenous people to truly participate in the Canadian economy as owners. This means providing nations with access to government funding programs, financing, and other benefits that many other non-Indigenous industry players have received for years. We recognize that to be treated as equal, we also need to take on significant risks associated with developing multi-billion dollar developments. Something we have proven with Cedar LNG that we are willing to do and highly capable of doing. There is no longer an alternative for us. Ownership is the only path for us to reconciliation and true prosperity. We have the revenues to help our people on our own terms in the way that reconnects them to our, to our culture and traditions. We can build critical community infrastructure from housing to schools to daycares, healthcare and elder care facilities. We can train our people with the skills needed to secure meaningful family supporting jobs and be meaningful contributors to, to the Canadian economy. It means an 11-year-old or 12-year-old girl walking to school in our village. <laughs> Can dream big in terms of careers and opportunities. <sighs> These are the supports we can provide our people so they can return home to their territory, lead authentic, healthy, and fulfilling lives. Sorry. Whew. Thank you. C 
Cedar LNG has given us an incredible opportunity, one we are committed to sharing the benefits and lessons with other nations. Because the reality, unfortunately, is that many Indigenous communities are living in poverty without access to clean energy or water, health services, and more. Nor do they have the funds to develop their territories in a manner that enables them to protect their culture and traditions and support their families, let alone future generations. While many would say reconciliation is underway in our country and the lives of Indigenous peoples are improving, I would ask them to read a report released last month by our province's First Nations Health Authority. It was a sad day when I read the report, an often too stark reminder about the inequalities and the divide that remains between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in this country. The report revealed that life expectancy for BC's First Nations dropped more than six years since 2017. Let that sink in. For the people that say that First Nations are getting their fair share or too much and that we have achieved reconciliation, I would ask them to consider the implications of these statistics. And when we are talking about building prosperity in this country, we will not achieve it unless each and every one of our citizens has equal access to supports and financing needed to live a healthy life. I've spoken a lot about our people and what we are doing. It is not entirely unique, as there are other nations across this country pursuing ownership in, num in a number of different developments in their territories. From critical mineral minerals to renewable energy, housing developments and beyond. These projects are contributing to the Canadian economy and providing infrastructure, jobs and revenues that we need as a country to overcome the volatility that we have experienced, in particular the past several years. They are also supporting the needs of our global community by providing cleaner energy options to help reduce global emissions, developing materials to support the energy transition and advancing the solutions needed to address challenges head on. And we need to do more. When I look back to what we have achieved, I will not rest easy until any community who wants to pursue projects like ours has the ability to find the right partners get a seat at the table and access to capital and be true owners of their economic future. But we can't succeed alone. I'm here because I want to do what is right for my community, but I also recognize how much more we can achieve when industry, government and society work together. To do so, we need business leaders, government banks and others to come together and recognize the incredible value of advancing these projects in an inclusive way. Like me, you are here today because you want to do what is best for our country and for future generations. The people in this room have the power to turn the tide. By removing barriers, by being fierce advocates and elevating position of every First Nations in this country, because when Indigenous people prosper, all Canadians prosper. So thank you for being here today, listening to my community's story and being a part of the fabric required to advance a truly prosperous and sustainable future for all. Thank you.